Welcome back, everybody. I just want to make a, a, an announcement uh, before, before I introduce the elders panel. So just please be reminded that Western University will be hosting the annual National Universities Canada Building Reconciliation Forum on June 26th, 28, 2023. The theme of the event is Education for Reconciliation, Rebuilding Stronger and with Intentionality. And discussions will be added by four relevant sub-themes. First one, Indigenous Knowledges as a Framework for Reconciliation and Education Sovereignty, Building Back from COVID-19, Innovations and Resiliencies. Third topic is uh, Understanding the Differences and Convergences between Indigenous Initiatives and Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. And the last subtopic is Indigenous Knowledges and Sustainable Development Goals. So again, proposals for presentations are currently being received up to the end of this month. So for access to additional details, please visit the Western Dean's Office of Indigenous Initiatives webpage or connect directly with Dr. Christy Brissett, who is here with us today. Here we go. We are going into our elders panel. I think we're all very excited to, and, and eagerly anticipating this one. I think we all had a peek at our agendas and got super excited. So uh, <clears throat> our elders panel will now speak on creating space, space for truth and healing. And before we begin, as many of you know, the late elder Millie Anderson spoke at last year's forum. And I'd like to acknowledge elder Millie's work on this important topic and her support throughout the first forum. Her knowledge will live on through this work. This morning, we're going to hear from Elder Ripa Evick Carlton and Elder Wanastsa Lorna Williams and Elder Joseph Netauhau. The panel will be moderated by, Doc, uh, by Marilyn Patra. Once again, the, the, the discussion will run for 60 minutes with half an hour at the end for the panelists to answer questions. Our virtual attendees may submit questions through the Q&A function. And our moderator, Marilyn Patra, is an ethical space designer a public speaker, a lawyer, and a positive deviant. Machif and Irish Scottish, born and raised in Southern Saskatchewan, Marilyn comes to her work in this field with passion and conviction and focuses her lens on relationship development on the Indigenous front. Please join me in welcoming one of my favorite people on the planet, Marilyn Patra. So good morning, everyone. We are, our heads are getting full. We're learning so many things over the last day and a half already. And now we're about to, to enter a cultural space that's specifically designed to say, now who are we to deal with this in cultural ways? Um, I just wanna give a little bit of context for where we are and, and, and to invite our teachers to join in the conversation. And we're at a really weird place. First of all, happy spring. And uh, yeah, right, happy spring and happy equinox. And so it matters that we're at that time. It matters that, that we are at a new moon, that we're redreaming our lives, and it matters that we're connected to all of those things. And I wanna acknowledge that. I want to acknowledge the absolute sincerity and just passion that's gone into the pipe ceremonies the last two mornings has been, uh, I cried personally this morning. And so it was really, um, it just really reminds you why our traditional practices are to get us all of our horses going in the same direction. So I just want to acknowledge that that happened for us two days in a row so that we can have these uh, uncomfortable conversations. I want to remind you that while we're in the middle of talking about, about fake identities, about pretendians, about uh, con artists, about deception, we're also in the midst of collecting our people back. The apprehended people, the um, IRS, um, you know, the, all of the side effects from residential school, colonialism at its worst, we're, we're, we're just pulling our people back. And so we're in the middle of 
the biggest house clean we've done culturally in a really long time. And it's messy, and but we can do it. It's messy, but we can do it. Um, I want to... I want to tell you what I heard in the last couple of days, just as we prepare to listen to our teachers. Um, I've heard, and Maria, uh, Maria is, is my closest mentor, and she's taught me that we don't, the col colonial impact, the, this the sort of white fraudster stuff, it's not ours. And that the people who have come to colonize this land over generations have come from their own trauma. Okay, so intergenerational effect isn't ours. Colonialism isn't ours. And everybody suffers from this. And so when you come from a country and a colony and a space that thinks it's okay to hunt women and burn them at stakes, when you come to the new land, that doesn't seem like such a crazy thing except for the people who are being hunted and burned at the stake. And so intergenerational effect is something that's been brought with them from their own tra traumatic histories and it's breeding into what we're doing. I had a conversation last night with uh, Zoe and we talked about the relationship between all of these pieces. Um, rehabilitation of white folk. I will use that. That should be a bumper sticker. That was so great. That was so great. Um, and so I love that. There was no jar to spit in at the door in case you didn't notice. Ancestry.com is not sponsoring this, this conference because that's not where we go to find out your 16 quarters and 32 seconds Indian or not, right? It's really more complicated than that. I will, so I just want you to notice what wasn't at the front door. Um, I want, I want to know, are you to notice um, that we're uncomfortable because we're supposed to be? and that it's not our job to worry about non-Indigenous people. That's not our job, it's not our work. Our work is to worry about ourselves. Our work is to worry about our children and our future and dreaming our future. And so what should, what should and can we be doing about that? What spaces do we own that we haven't really thought about? Um, my husband and I have put together almost 20 books on different First Nations in Saskatchewan and um, when we go to figure out what the title is, we go to one of the elders that we interviewed. And at one point, we went to ask the elder, what should the title of this book be? And he said, Pasigok. Am I saying it right? Pasigok, wake up. And he meant it in a very cultural sense. <laughs> All the words have action attached to them, right? Pasigok, wake up. So this discomfort as uncomfortable as it is, is waking us up. Did you hear all the whispers over the last days of, I don't speak my language, what would the words be for that? What is the word for this? We're remembering, we're re-embodying who we are in the midst of saying, she's not one of us, what the heck? So there's always a reason for why Pasigok comes and happens. So I wanna remind you of that. Um, have you ever done a detox? Hands up, don't lie. Anybody ever detoxed in this room? What happens when you detox? What happens when you give up coffee for a week? You get a headache. Why do you get a headache? The toxins go up to your brain and they go up there because your blood flow is constantly, the brain is a thing that the body tries to protect no matter what. And so the blood is going up there and any toxins that are coming out are going up to your brain and it hurts for a while until you can eliminate them. We're detoxifying. It's really uncomfortable. And lots of us have headaches from going into workspaces that need detoxing. So I'm trying to give you something to uh, hang on to, to know that this isn't forever and it's hard work, but it's worth it. It's worth detoxifying in the end. Customary adoption and legal adoption are absolutely part of who we are. And, and we've heard several times um, Maria say to us, our babies are every color. 
Our babies have every blood form in them. You know, I, I taught at a university one time where um, there was a German uh, fellow doing a presentation on race, and he said they had over 60 identifiers for different people in Germany because they were trying to literally track every combination of human. And we ended up with, you know, Indian, Métis, and Inuit. And so we, they, you can go in either way on those. Um, and so we can't, we can't forget we adopt people. We can't forget that our extended families, our traditional teachers, I've had a student do some research for me on identity and who, who's part of our communities as Métis people. And that was the realm and the jurisdiction of the matriarch in the family. And it wasn't based on the spit in the jar that you didn't have to do today. And so this is a complicated conversation. So without taking up any more time, I want to move to who's best to visit with. I wanna hold the tobacco and I wanna honor the teachings of Elder Dennis from this morning and say, the way we talk about this matters, the words that we release into the air about this change the vibration of who we are and to do this in a way that is coming absolutely from our hearts. I wanna acknowledge that, um, that the late Elder Millie Anderson can't be with us. Thank you for raising that Neo. She was a respected elder, caring mother and grandmother who took great pride in helping students and staff with the beating circle at FNUC Regina campus. She was born in the Northwest Territories and part of the elders Kadea council for many years. The late elder Millie spoke of the inaugural national, national Ind indigenous identity forum on elders perspectives on kinship and identity last March and we want to acknowledge her role then, and I want to acknowledge her spirit with us now. Of course, she's with us right now. Of course, she's here. And now I want to bring in our teachers. We've got Dr. Wanotsak Lorna Williams, Elder Associate Professor Emeritus, Indigenous Education, University of Victoria. Dr. Lorna, Elder... Elder Lorna is a professor emerita of Indigenous Education, Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Victoria and Canada's Research Chair in Education and Linguistics. She's been living and breathing the calls to action on education and language since before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was ever a magist. Hello. Right? She built her career on the principle that quality education for Indigenous children must be characterized by strong cultural teachings alongside Euro Western education. As a child, Wanotsuk was sent to Indian Day School and then to residential school at St. Joseph's Mission, where her Lilwat language was lost. Shortly after returning home from residential school, she was hospitalized for hepatitis, and community elders assisted her in recovery and the relearning of her language. In turn, she became an English interpreter for the elders in her community. Lorna helped to develop the writing system for the Lilwat and co-authored the first curriculum and learning resources for teachers to teach language in school. These materials continue to be used to teach today. In 1973, Wanopsa was instrumental in opening the Mount Curry Band Controlled School only the second First Nation community in Canada to do so. The school was delivered an in, the school delivered an innovative curriculum including Lilwa and European Canadian knowledge, histories, values, with instruction given in both Lilwa and English. Each course was carefully negotiated to ensure that they did not colonize the children. At the University of Victoria, Dr. Williams initiated and led the development of bachelor's and master's degrees in Indigenous language revitalization and master's in counseling in Indigenous communities. She also initiated, designed, and implemented a mandatory course in Indigenous education for all teacher education students, leading to the requirement that all teacher education programs in British Columbia include that education. Next, we have Elder Joseph Netahau, my brother. Elder Joseph Netahau is an award-winning Plains Woodland Cree, Nehiao, interdisciplinary artist from the Sturgeon Lake First Nation in Saskatchewan. Joseph's generosity and compassion for sharing cultural knowledge makes him a much sought-after speaker, performer, facilitator, outdoor educator, 
for adults and children alike, both regionally and internationally. A longtime resident in Saskatoon, he's been playing music and telling stories, both tall and short, he notes, for over 35 years. In addition to Joseph's busy schedule of performances, he's served as cultural advisor to various institutions such as residencies, Indigenous teacher education program in Saskatoon, and multiple universities across Turtle Island. Joseph holds a Bachelor of Education degree from Indigenous Teacher Education Program and can currently be found at the College of Law, where he serves as emergency, emerging, <laughs> emergency, probably on some days, um, elder cultural advisor. He's pleased to share his creative life experience, coyote trickster tendencies, and cultural knowledge when he's invited to do so. Our last elder will be with us by Zoom, and unfortunately, you have to look at me in 3D uh, until we can get her on there. Um, and it is Elder Ripa Evick from Carleton, elder and therapist in Inugoktik Center for Inuit Children, Youth, and Families. Ripa was born in Cumberland Sound, Nunavut, and then relocated to the community of Pengatang, Nunavut, when she was five years old. In the North, her work experience included working for 10 years as the housing manager in Pengnertung and one year as community social worker in protection and in child protection. In 1989, Riva moved to Ontario. In Ottawa, she spent seven years working as a family support worker at Nusuvia. Somebody say it with me. Say it again. Tunganuk Suvievik, close enough. Working closely with the shelter and sitting on the AIDS committee in Ottawa. She also worked at Pakturi, the National Association for Inuit Women, coordinating national archives around the issues of substance abuse, and then co founded the Mam Mamesarvik Healing Center the first Inuit-specific trauma and addiction treatment center in Southern Canada. At Mama Sarvik, she worked as a therapist and then the program coordinator. In 2017, Riva, Ripa joined the in, Inu, Inukaltik Center for Inuit Children, Youth and Family, where she works as a therapist and facilitates parenting programs and healing circles for mothers. So we have so much knowledge available to us today. And I would love to say, we're going to dream now, okay? We can talk about the problems. We can talk about the hard work we, it takes. We can talk about who's doing the work and the implications of it. But we also need to dream our futures. So what I'd like is to set this up as close to Kyoge win as we can get, as close to visiting as we can get. So I'm going to I'm going to ask us to imagine that we've got a Carrie Barassa, a Mary Ellen Terpel, a Joseph Boyden. Uh, there's a long list. Those are the famous three right now, Michelle. Um, and and I want that that they're in the room with us, and that we're going to do this in a way that we care about each other, but we have hard conversations and decisions to make, and what that might look like as we start to deal with really hard issues in our community and what that might sound and feel like and who better to visit with and ask those questions to than our traditional teachers. So Ripa, if you can hear me, I would love for you to start us off with your thoughts as you've been listening to the conversations and your life experience and what you've seen uh, working in the area that you work in. Then we'll move to Joseph and then we'll move to, to Lorna. So thank you everyone. Let's get started. Ripa? <laughs> Thank you for having me here today. Um, just uh, a little bit about my history I like to share. Um, um, maybe to also say that I have uh, eight children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. So it was mentioned that I was born on the land when my people still solely rely off the land. 
and being born um, in the dark season in, in the winter, um, I imagine that the, the light would have come from a traditional oil lamp, which we call the Qudluk. The Qudluk really did allow us to survive as Inuit people in a harsh em environment, particularly in the winter months. The Qudluk was used for a source of cooking, source of warmth, and source of light at the time. And uh, my memories are uh, of um, a life that was very comfortable, very secure, um, and harmony with the people and the land. And it was just a, a great way uh, to be born into this world. Um, and when I was about five years old, uh, my family was forcefully moved from this wonderful uh, place that I call my first home. Um, and um, it was uh, a time where, um, where my first five years were spent. And so uh, the love I felt from other families who lived with us, from my parents, from my, um, from my grandparents, um, it was, it's a wonderful memory I, I cherish within myself. Um, and so uh, before I begin, I want to acknowledge and thank all the people who have paved the way for us, us meaning indigenous people. I know we once had a system that worked well for, for, for the people because we had the power, control, and independence in all of our uh, areas of our lives. And um, I did not experience going to residential school, but uh, two of my siblings went to residential school. Um, and I was too young to remember exactly what happened during the forced relocation, but I've really been privileged to learn from the stories of, of my elders and for, from the adults that were um, mothers and at the time uh, when this happened to my people. One of the stories I really wanted to say impacted me in such a way that I think it really helped me guide me in a way that my life has formed. My mom and dad always took me back to that wonderful place even after my three children were born. We would go out camping and lived where I was born for the good part of the summer. This, I, I can't say she was an elder then, but she was um, one of the people that were forcefully moved and I know her children. I used to go um, looking through old campsites just to find anything I could find, whether it was pieces of glass or beads or um, marble, anything I could find within these old campsites. Mm -hmm. And so um, I had my youngest child back then in my Amauti when this elder, my uh, an adult came over and sat beside me. And I wasn't really thinking of what to say to her, but I remember just a thought came to my mind and I did ask her how it was when they were moved. And I was really surprised at her response to my question because she, she just started crying and she cried and cried. I just let her be. 
And uh, when she was able to share her story, she did let me know that they left everything, everything, all of their uh, possessions, they had to leave and they were moved. So that was the case in my mother and father's uh, situation too. So from that, I really understood the depth of loss and grief my people have carried because of these policies that were uh, imposed upon them by, by the people from the South without the input of my people. So that, that has been a, um, a real um, a moment where I really treasured that. And there's been many others who've shared their stories with me. Um, so I also, uh, because I was born um, at the time when we didn't go to school, the learning that we got was from our parents by example, by, by watching. And so I would have uh, been uh, groomed to become a capable um, person because I'm a, I, I was born a female I would have been groomed to become capable in caring for the uh, the children, my husband to be, and and care for the the kamma, the salt house, and also learn about the kudlit, which uh, which was used at the time. So and learn to sew and all of the things that I needed to become a good mother, a good, a good wife. So in the Inuit system, we, we have a child rearing called Inunguinuk, making of capable human beings. And those were still practiced at the time. So um, because I was too young to learn at the time, there's um, skills I did not learn because when we were forcefully moved, we had to go to school and the learning from our parents 24 hours a day wasn't there anymore. So, and a pullet wasn't being used anymore when we were moved. So I did not really learn to like the pullet until I moved south, until I really had to look at myself as an Inuk and, uh, and learn the skills I did not learn at the time. So <clears throat> I like to speak a little bit about uh, the Maligate, which my people have practiced. Um, back then it was more practice every day and people still have this Maligate within themselves. Uh, they are essential beliefs that Inuit have held for generations. Elders describe Maligai as fundamental laws. Maligai define how people should live with each other. They also describe how people can connect with their environment. Maligai are the foundation of Inuit which are eight principles that which Inuit have always known for a very long time. They provide a foundation for our spiritual development as well. And these are the four Maligate, working together for common good. Number two, respecting all living things. Three, maintaining harmony and balance and continually planning and preparing for the future. And out of the eight Inuit principle, I like to mention uh, principle number seven, which is uh, in Inuktitut. It's a concept of being resourceful to solve problems through creativity, adaptability, and flexibility. And um, the fourth principle, 
the concept of co consensus, decision making, communicating skills, development of shared understanding and respecting other perspectives and world views by coming together as we are, as you have been coming together, uh, we are at this meeting to plan and prepare for our future and prevent further harm by responding to the issue. And by raising our concerns and discussing them, including el which you are including elders and you and the Inuit Métis and First Nations people and others as well. And for <clears throat> Inuit Seapagutit, for living a good life, I also want to say that these are the things that my people have practiced. Inuit Seapagutit are sayings or words to live by that have been passed down over generations. Uh, serve, Inuit Seapagutti serve many purposes in the intention of helping people, which is a very important concept. It involves embracing the teachings of Inuit Kaujimayatukangi, such as contribute, share, care, belonging, live well, be respectful, and celebrate life. The meaning and value of human existence come from always striving to live a good life. Living a good life is really about being healthy in a holistic way in ourselves, in our families, and in our communities, and in relation to our natural world. And um, <clears throat> one of the things that have been taught to me by my elders is that because of how things have happened to us as Inuit people, uh, we've had to go through a lot of changes that really, really impacted us and even to this day have really impacted us. And for many of us, we've had to really come to a place of looking at ourselves and really looking in and saying where uh, we, we as people have needed to heal. And that's a big, it's a big thing. It's a big concept, but one by one, we, we can get there. And my people have been in this healing journey for quite a while now. And I do really want to emphasize that, um, there's systems there um, and because of our personal experiences for myself, um, I know that I've had to do this work in order to be where I am today. And I really encourage people that, that need to move and uh, go, into, go into that work because it's really work. It's, it may be messy, but um, but uh, it's well worth going into because uh, it really does put us in a good place within ourselves. And I've, I've come to a place where I am proud to be an Inu. I, I'm happy to say that I matter like everybody else on this earth and that uh, our uh, confidence and our self-esteem may have been impacted, but we can gain it back as well as all of the things that we've lost during this time where it was very uncertain for us as uh, indigenous people. I'm gonna stop here for now. And um, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer what I can. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ripa. Thank you so much for that. We'll move on to Joseph. Dance. Hey, I'm coming out here. Namaskat Naga, Gyogan Nashum Naga Pita Gutti. 
Good to see everybody here. know to sit together and to talk and have a conversation. Just wanted to uh, sing a little song. One of the things that really grounds me. This is a Gray Buffalo drum group out in uh, Gordon's George Gordon First Nation. I guess I'm appropriating there. <laughs> <laughs> melody a little bit <laughs> and just change the words a little bit mm -hmm. <laughs> So asta means come. Pito tik over here. Unimi dog dancers. And the second line is astam. Bimu chikita. Come and have fun. Lost souls. So I just changed the word a little bit. <laughs> we have a lot of lost souls out here in the world. I'm not sure if the word pretendians is accurate, but uh, we have words in our language, you know, I defer to, you know, a language that I almost lost. And uh, when I uh, started my journey at a very young age, you know, five years old, uh, being colonized, I started hearing words uh, in English, and then I had to return back 20 years, some 15, 13 years later. Then I started hearing these other words of where I was at, you know. I was in a perfectly good place for the first few years. I had uh, grandparents who loved me, you know, it's like, hey, it's like, you know, it's like they looked after me. You know, they, I used to probably wear rabbit skin pants and all this stuff. I wore the old regalia, right? The old traditional clothing. And that's how I remember, but I don't really, really remember. But uh, the word that comes to mind is a one sin, one sin, you know, lost. A one sin, something took them down a path of being temporarily lost. And so that's, those are the words, I like working with words because they kind of zero in on the subject or the topic. You know, the, uh, <clears throat> the word applies to me as well. We never really, you know, when we're sharing everything that we share, it comes from our own experiences. So that was me when I was about 20. I was the one in the end. The one in the end, you know, wandering, I didn't even know I was a Nihio. When I didn't know that I was Cree. Nobody told me that. But remember, I remember we used to play basketball and we'd say this one word. E <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Somebody thought of that word. It was more than Northern kids say in Northern students. <clears throat> Their language is intact in Northern, the woodland Cree. I used to say, what does it mean? I used to say, you know, oh, hey, let's go, you know, in English. But even then, it didn't register that I was, you know, a Nihio. It didn't register at all. It was just that how lost or found, you know, as a colonial, you know, as an English person, you know, as acting the way Duncan Camp and Scott, said, you know, said in his words, you know, take the Indian out of the child. It was perfection in motion. That exactly happened. English was not too bad. I could speak pretty good English. Sometimes I'll go and talk in English to my relatives, you know, showing off this new language <laughs> that I had. I could speak it quite well, but it was didn't make any sense to me, really. But uh, I just uh, want to refer to a uh, our teacher, uh, the teacher that I refer to now is uh, Wisagitzak, Stisano, our elder brother. As you get older, I'm, I'm 70 years old, and uh, I've met a lot of Kehiteyak elders. 
Niissä poitiaan, they're all left, you know, they all left me. He peguas katagoya, and it's like all alone. But they didn't really leave me, because in connecting with them, they connected me to beyond the physical plane. You know, in, so I can connect with them and call them mushum, nokum. We can call on them in a sweat lodge. But the ones that I often uh, refer to are my namesakes. They go me, the ones that I work with within the sweat lodge. The namesakes are uh, my my traditional name. I often have fun with kids, you know, I'm going to share you my name. I want you to repeat it after me. <laughs> Try that. On a good day, on that day, he walks. Or as a psychic told me, I went to a psychic and uh, she says, oh, you are the one who is guided by the spirit of the day. So I really like that. I thought, that's a really nice way to put it. Now I found a nice way to explain myself. It's nice, even though I get into precarious situations daily. <laughs> it's still, <laughs> it's nice <laughs> that you could use your name. But the other name is uh, Okuma Otagino. I uh, share these names because of uh, this event that we're having. I know myself. I found myself to a point anyway. I'm still... I'm still not completely there. The journey is not complete. We're also from the stars. You know, there's a spirit that's way up there that looks down on us. And uh, old George Manti put it in so beautifully. Three people have been placed here. The creator had pity. He had pity on his people, Nihil. So he found a nice place to place them. And that's where they would uh, practice their way of life. You know, there, there was a lot of buffalo there. There's, he's from this area, Buffalo, uh, from uh, Piapot. George Manti is one of my teachers. I used to wonder what happened, you know, to old George. I hadn't seen him for a while. He was a herbalist and he had a, he had a uh, suitcase. And there was about three or 400 vials inside that suitcase. I was just amazed at how much knowledge this man had. And uh, I would look at the syllabics, I couldn't understand. And then George, lots of learning, lots of knowledge. And one day I asked uh, <clears throat> uh, one of her, one of his relatives, I was, you know, when did George pass away, you know, and then how was it, you know, oh, he passed away, but he's still around here at the house. <laughs> he still hangs around here. So I said, oh, Tapu, yeah, so he never really left. I thought, well, that's good that we have these reserves, you know, we shouldn't eradicate these reserves. The ancestors are still around. And so uh, I went to that place. I didn't feel him, but he's, the, uh, the, the, her, or her niece was there looking after the place now. And her niece protected him before he passed away because he was getting overwhelmed by people. And so uh, I went to the house there and I uh, went and visited. And she said, oh yeah, he's still around. My husband was out lawn mowing. All of a sudden, George was there right beside him, mowing the lawn with him. I thought, oh, my mushroom is still around. Uh, my mushroom is still visiting. You know, Dean Piapod is still there. So, we saw Gates and got some one up. So, I'll go tell you a little story because that's how I learned. You know, I learned through trickster stories. I learned through really wild stories that are about farting and, you know, bodily function. <laughs> I won't share those ones today. You know, it's right. <laughs> I know we've had some good food, you know. <laughs> Perhaps didn't agree with us. <laughs> and uh, this, the story is to help us, I guess, make sense of some of what's happening in the world, in our territory. And we're going to what they're going to It's not for any, you know, no reason. That, I mean, for us getting together here all across Canada. 
can he post them I have to stand up to this my peg that when things go wrong we come together as a collective in my pego may know muy quick muy quick is peg things have gone wrong ego can the kind of we have to stop it however we can and more it uh, and we stop it to protect the individual as well you know we don't stop it because we're upset and they're absconding you know our way of life and all this you know we do it we do it compassionately get the market doing you know saggy who you win see what to that doing that's what i was told in the sweat lodge you know couple couple samago so we say it's like you say mom to need that it all starts with the mind eh your mom to needs again and so he mom to need that that we know the uh I really want to be like the buffalo. I want to copy them. I want to be regal and majestic. You know, Paskats Iwapsk is it. Of course, you have to see the white buffalo. I want to be a white buffalo, <laughs> the sacred white buffalo. They found a big herd. Hey. Fancy, Pasquamustak, how are you, Buffalo Buffalo people? The chief came up there, Hogamau. Sakigwe Gunstis, what do you want, elder brother? You're up to something, aren't you? No more, no more. No, no, I'm really my uh, intentions are uh, are 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 good. <laughs> my intentions are for the good. Aha, keep amaga, hurry up. Tell us what you want. I want to be like you. I want to change. I want to turn into you. Well, this way I'll go and sit with the vice provost. <laughs> or whatever, the committee anyway. <laughs> the Buffalo Committee. <laughs> so I went to the vice, I mean, the committee, Buffalo, the Buffalo Chief and Council. <laughs> Give them some kind of a title anyway. I'll be why knew I woke him out. The chief came back. Aha, Winanto. Winanto, you can try it. We'll give you a trial period. Four days, let's say. <laughs> so, we saw it. That's my kid, They're all excited. What are we going to do? Wow, you turn on the ground four times, roll over four times. Hmm. Oh, wait a second, that's easy. Okay. And all of a sudden, he was a buffalo, white buffalo. Kind of scruffy looking, but he was a buffalo nevertheless. Take the pasigo. Hey, that when Mewson, I'm really beautiful. Wah, wah, and the Pasquamus, and I'm a buffalo now, a white buffalo of all things. I go tan siga, what do I do now? And the Ogamau, he says, and then I got to key, in Aspeto, I come, just pay attention, you're copying us, you know, means you have to do what we do eat the grass, jump around, go to buffalo wallow, but stay with the herd. I hope me I do. I that say you know. I hope me I do. Don't go anywhere that's you know by yourself. Don't just wander off. Ow! Oh, gee, was all excited. It was almost so dumb. So he became a buffalo. Acted like a buffalo. Ate the grass. Kind of bitter at first. And then he just started enjoying his life as a buffalo the first day. And he said, he said, oh, the second day he went out, wandered off. It looks really good over there. I'll go to the grass over there. It looks really good. So he wandered off. When you start wandering about, you never know where you're going to wind up. Pretty soon he was far. Far from the herd. And he, uh, he saw some people coming, Nihilk, some uh, hunters you know, on horseback. 
They said, hey, Nihi, look, no aku maga. Like, there's some of our relatives over there. And they were, we could scurry, they were, we could scurry. So they were running towards him, you know, and they were holding bone arrows and spears <laughs> and they were pointing at him, you know. <laughs> They're coming to get me. Holy. They're really serious. They're holding these weapons. Oh, and Tapasio, he started running back towards the herd. Turn precise, um, say, I tam, what you're just zigzagging all the way back, you know. And he was out of shape, you know, so he was really slow, you know. Pama is he was lucky to be spared, you know, just collapsed back in the buffalo herd. Ogamal came back. And some guy, tan, what did I tell you? You're wandering around all over, just stay with the herd. Oh, Skate, you know, I know. <laughs> and I'm you know, they're just chasing me all over. Uh, you guys, I am unkip mad soon. Wow, your life is hard. But, you know, I'll stick with the herd. Another day came. Uh, I mean, went wandered off into Blackfoot territory. Uh, so, 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 yeah, but, you know, he was running for his life again, you know, and this time he just about got killed, you know, there's an arrow that just went right into that little beard, you know. Mm -hmm. The box, you know, he just collapsed and, hey, hey, oh, your life is so difficult, my relatives, my brothers and sisters. I don't know if I want your life. I am money. Because so after the fourth day of thinking about it, I think I want to go back into the human world. You know, I think I want to be human again, two-legged. And so Danske Totaman, what should I do? So Ugamau said, Kitampokanaspati you must turn back the way that you came from. Niwao four times. Ikse Niwao. So he became Wisagitag again. And he looked at his brothers and sisters. No, I thank you for teaching me about your way of life. Even though I don't even though I don't really want your way of life, we could still live together. And uh, he said, no, I'll look after you. There's always reciprocity in these stories. You know, Isagi Itzag will always look after whoever is gifted him with knowledge and tradition, you know, or knowledge, knowledge or experience. So he said, no, I'll watch over you, make sure that uh, people don't harm you as much. You know, when I think about that story, <clears throat> I, I sometimes think that song, you know, about Kstisano, uh, and it says, uh, there's many verses. You know, I am Wisagitak. That's who they call me. Everyone is my little brother, my little sister. And um, when I think about that, you know, it's like, geez, I got to be, you got to frame it differently. But that's an invitation song when you want help. You know, when we want we Chat to come and give us uh, messages, you know, we call on him that way. And uh, sometimes I, it's like, it's like you're saying it to yourself. We saggy tag and they go in. I am we saggy tag. <laughs> some people some sometimes reference me as we saggy tag. Say, no, 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 it's a song. It's a it's a spirit. Not to be made fun of. It's a very serious uh, teacher in our culture. He's a really as a storyteller. He's a, he's a, there's another way he's a knowledge keeper. And he's a pastor, he passes on traditional knowledge from the other side. He, you know, he still informs us about what's going on. What a beautiful place to be, right? Why would, would not, I mean, anybody would want that, right? 
anybody would want that. So you can understand that from these people who are pretending to be us. They want something that they don't quite understand fully because I understand it from experience. I used to go visit old people and uh, I'm 13 years in residential school and then university. I was completely brainwashed. And I mean, <laughs> I hate to say, put it that way, but that's what they used to say. And they could not go out in the mountain and they really cleaned my mind off of any indigenous way of knowing. They, they, every little stain, you know, of a, you know, memory of who I was, was completely almost erased. It's now, hey, Kasi, 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 Namun is a word. When the Northern Woodland Cree use the word Kasi, Namun, they use it in the context of, context of their own understanding of spirit. Mantugusma, the Jesus, you know, the Lord. Kasi, Namun, all my sins, you know, Kasi, Namun. I read it. I said, wow, that's a strong word up north. It's, it still applies. So I call this syndrome Wisagi Tag. Wisagitag is it's the teacher, the storyteller, the knowledge keeper. Atsuin is the behavior. So we all have that. I always, I always tell people that's who we are. We're both spirit and physical. We mustn't forget that. And um, I can speak from it, you know, because I know that's what I went through. And yeah. And I just wanted to close off a little bit here, but I'm looking forward to listening to Laurel, Laurel here. So I referenced some old people, but uh, I wrote notes here. I like my cell phone, you know, I was just really addicted to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like I put poetry, I put all kinds of stuff in there. So to wind back what I nearly lost in the 13 years of white man's way of life that was initially decided of me by age five, by a kind and loving creator or spirit is truly the most beautiful way I now live. I am now living in the last stage of my life. I can see why a human from another culture would want what I have because of its tremendous wealth of wisdom, stories, songs, and teachings. And it's only a small percentage that I learned a very small percentage. There's so much the old people knew that are gone. Incredible libraries. Who's to say that our people who no longer practice their original instructions are not pretending to be someone else? That's something to think about too, right? You know, who's to say? I know from experience that I really was convinced into believing the white man way of life was superior to mine. Even though I identified as Canadian, I found it extremely difficult to accept. It messed up my life for many years. It takes time to find your truth. In one lifetime, it may be possible to arrive at some conclusion to understand why you are Indian, European, etc. My journeys have taken me to other parts of the world and other lenses, new age, paranormal, psychic phenomena, Tibetan Buddhism, and Nihiawitawan, Cree worldview, to name a few. I don't need to pretend anymore that I'm what Canada wanted me to be. An Indian with no culture, no language, no story, no land. I am always and I will forever be connected to the land as long as I'm Nihio. I don't need to own the land. It owns me and welcomes me every day. I know who I am. <laughs> I I introduced myself, the lands from which I, which my family comes from. I greet the ancestors of the, these lands on which we meet today. 
to discuss this very, very um, heart-wrenching, confusing topic. And it's a very difficult one for me uh, to understand and to negotiate. And I want to thank the people who invited me to come to, to, to spend time with you. I thought about what I would talk about and share with you um, from the vantage point of being, having lived a long life. And in my, in my, amongst my people, when people gather together, to talk about it, to talk about things, to try to figure things out. Usually at the end of the session, however long it could be, a day, two days, three days, however long. But at the very end, there are people, old people who usually have an opportunity to say something. And oftentimes the last speaker was a woman, was an old woman. And everybody would kind of sigh because they didn't, they, they knew they were going to be a little bit scolded about not covering a certain area or in that, and the name of that talk was usually in my language, it's a beautiful word. It kind of means to swat somebody. And, and oftentimes, these old women knew skillfully how to do this with kind but strong words. So I'm going to try to do that to remind, to remind us that this topic is a much more, it has a much greater, longer history than what we've focused, what we're focusing on. The woman mostly, except for Joseph, who is sitting here right now too. Um, but it's been mostly women who we've identified. And, but this idea of pretending is long, has a long, long history. And I just want to remind us that our displacement, dislocation, relocation is part of the colonial process to take our lands and to take away our sense of who we are and our connection to those lands. There are so many policies, laws, practices, habits that have promoted the removal of our people. So I remember as a child going with my father when he would go to Vancouver to sell his furs, there was only one place in Vancouver where we could where we could go as native people: Skid Row or Chinatown. Those are the only places where we could go to a hotel because we were definitely native Indian. So for many people, one of my aunties being one of them, because she was a little bit fair, she said she was Italian. So that she could go to other places more freely. She could live a life that we certainly couldn't live. So many of our people took that path, denying their heritage, 
denying their identity, reconstructing an identity in order to be able to just travel to different places in our country. That's painful. It was painful, painful for my mom to see her, her, sometimes her sister and not be able to approach her. And it's been painful for my mother's sister's children when in their 50s and 60s, they discovered that they were not Italian, that they were Shlatskim. And to watch them now try to renegotiate who they are has been painful. Not just for them, but for us. This has happened in many families. As a, as a teacher, an instructor, a professor at the university, I created a course called Learning and Teaching in Indigenous World and designed it so that people could experience our way of being, the strengths of our teachings and for people to experience it by living it in a place that's foreign, in a place that's alien to that way of life. I wanted to see if it was possible for me to create it, not just for our people, but for others to experience. I watched the people who, were, who participated in this. In an environment that stratifies, that imposes a class structure, that imposes that there are some people who are better than others. In a place where people, some people can be heard and others not. That's a university. Where a young person cannot speak in the presence of the old, or the old cannot speak in the presence of the middle, where one gender has more voice than the other. That's a university. And I wanted to be able to bring our world and to see if it could be created, recreated in this space and to watch people as they experience that sense of belonging that sense of inclusion, that sense of community, that sense of relationship. One of the activities was just going outside of that concrete building and having them with a knowledgeable elder experience the earth what the earth is and what the earth gifts us. And even in, the, in that, those grounds, manicured grounds, our plants continued to live. Our plants could continue to give. And for our people, for all that little community could witness, could feel, 
could understand what they walked by every day and to see it in a different way was such a gift, not just to our people, but to that entire community. I share with this with you because the knowledge that indigenous people, not the just the indigenous people of the lands of Canada, but the indigenous peoples around the world. And I've traveled to many places in the world and spent time with indigenous people. For example, I was invited to spend time with the, the Taino people in Cuba a few years ago. The first time that they were gathering for many, many, many years, because everybody had said they were all gone. But these people wanted to share that they still held the knowledge of their ancestors. And I want you to know that in our communities, that knowledge of our ancestors continues. And it's important that we share this. In one of those classes, and these classes in the learning and teaching in, in, in an indigenous world, I constructed it using largely the concepts and the principles of learning and teaching from my language. What I had learned from the elders, the old people in my village. Well, this was second class. I'm telling you out of a group of Usually there were 50 to 60 people in these classes. There were 10 people who attended this one class. And I'm telling you, they cried at every class. I had to let them cry. I had to stand with them, hold them. Who were these 10 people? These were students who had been taken from their families and adopted to many, many parts of the world. Some had very tough lives. Others had beautiful lives with good families. But as they were experiencing, having this experience, they realized what they needed and that it was possible for them to reconnect. I'm reminding you that in these conversations that we're having about identity fraud, many of those people are gonna get caught up in this, in this debate. And I just wanna caution you with the way that we talk about it, the way that we carry out our business. I want you to remember all the people who have been disconnected from in so many different ways. In order for my father, to take himself and his family to Vancouver to sell his furs, he had to ha carry a document, permission from the Indian agent to be away from the community. If he didn't respect the time frame, we would have lost our status. And many people, that happened to many, many of our people. Many, many of our people who no longer, could no longer live in their communities. 
all the women who lost their status and their children's status. All those people are searching for and finding their way home. I was so happy yesterday when someone said, our communities need support to be able to piece together who is a member of their community, of their nation. When I, when I, when I look at some of the communities, and I've seen this and I watched this all my life. The challenges that they face, our communities face, to deal with call it the, the effects of colonization and the, and the organized planned way to destroy our communities. And I watch people in our communities work over here to try to solve this work over here to try to solve that, work on this side. It's unbelievable. And some of our communities are not that big. And there are not that many people who devote their lives to making these changes. And so, yes, I really agree with a young woman who said that yesterday, because whatever we do, I would hope that one of the things that we put into place is a way for this conversation to be conducted in our communities in the presence of elders, in the pre with the stories that are told from our people. Because those stories would contain the lessons that we need, the lessons of generosity, the lessons of kindness, the lessons of belongingness, the lessons of struggles through our own silliness as humans. And we need those lessons. One of the stories that I heard as a, as a teenager was a set of prophecies that were given to indigenous peoples of these lands. And I participated in a ceremony in the sharing of this prophecy on the shores of Vancouver as medicine people came descendants of the of the people who took the, who who were holding this prophecy and it was interesting because in the prophecy that that was said that came before the coming of the Europeans to our shores that, there we, that we would know the time when we, it's important for us to be able to teach our ways. Where our white brothers and sisters are open to hearing, they said, we'll know that time when the eagle lands on the moon. And when our brothers, white brothers and sisters, once again, wear the skins and the furs of our animal brothers and sisters. That was always very important for me to know and to hear 
Because in order for us to change institutions like higher education, the school system, it's so daunting. It's, you know, there are universities, as somebody said yesterday, have a long, long history. And the way that universities were constructed, they were constructed to be, to remove people, to exclude. They had moats around them. So how do you open up these spaces? I thought it's too challenging, too daunting to be able to do this. There are many people I know who've spent their lives changing systems, changing institutions, and to be able to open them up to our ways. So it's important that we bring our knowledges from our families, from our communities, from the stories and the songs that we've learned from, that have kept us strong. It's important to share those so that other people can learn. And I want you to know how hungry I could see at the University of Victoria where I taught these courses, I could see how hungry people were to experience the sense of connectivity, the sense of relationship, the sense of caring and inclusion, no matter who you are. And we need to be able to build these into our practices and our way of working with one another, being with one another. And we need to be able to build the ways in which all our people, whatever color you are, whatever gender you are, however you identify yourself, to feel that you have a place in this beautiful, beautiful land of ours. And so there's lots of work to do for us to rebuild. So don't get blinded by this, you know, the few people that have said they're indigenous, you know, after all these years, I just think that's such an irony that we're spending all this money and time and energy talking about that small group who say they want to be native in all these years when people have said that's the last thing they want to be. And so many of our people have had to withstand all the racism to be able to participate and to be able to do the work. And that continues. I also want to remind you that one of the things that I've seen, unfortunately, and this has happened around the world, that as people regain a voice after living 
in the silencing of colonization, that sometimes that voice is used against each other. In my work with languages, in our communities, and I'm glad that I'm here able to say this to this room, that I've watched and I've seen the pain that people have imposed on each other. You don't pronounce it right. You don't say it right. You don't teach it right. And so it's really important that we're, we're aware and we remember that this can happen. It's a natural process as people regain their stand on this earth in a good way. And there are so many teachings amongst our people and in our stories that can help us to negotiate that. So let's next time spend time with that too, to hear those stories and to learn from them and to learn from our way of being together. Thank you. Okay. I want you to notice that when our traditional teachers speak, and all of you will know this, that they contextualize who they are. I come here from this space with these teachings to share with you from my perspective, what I see and what I live. It's not academic, it's lived. It's their life story. All three of our teachers did that today. We have context for everything. Elder Ripa said thank you to the people who paved the way. These are the people, these are the giants. These are three of the giants that we have on the stage with us right now, whose shoulders we are standing on. And so whose shoulders did they stand on? Who else are holding you up? I heard that. Displacement came up right off the bat. Dislocation, disconnection. An understanding that it's not just us who experience that, but other people as well. Joseph reminded us that we've all got some experience with this, where we've tried to be somebody else, tried to fit in spaces that aren't our spaces. We have all got imposter syndrome somewhere at some point in some time. What does that feel like? Can you speak to the issue that we've come together to talk about from the place of honesty with yourself about that? I heard that. I heard that we need to look after ourselves. I heard that that's the first thing. Are you looking after yourself? I heard Elder Lorna say, be gentle and be kind and be firm and be strong. As you talk to people, are you creating what we call easily lateral violence, but are you harming other people around? Who's getting splashed by the work that we do? What is our work? I I I want to open this up to people with the context of what is our work because it occurs to me while Elder Lorna is speaking that we need some space in these rooms not just to talk about what's wrong and how terrible it is and what the psychology behind it is which which was a wonderful discussion 
but are we supporting each other? Do you feel supported in your space? Who's not here? Who should be here? So we are actually at the lunch hour, but I don't want to end without allowing an opportunity for somebody to bring their heart into this space and to ask our teachers, bring a comment, bring a question, share one of their own teachings. If a story was nudged awake in you in the last hour and a half, can you share it with us? I want to gently open that up to the floor. It's three hard acts to follow. I get it. Yes, Bobby. So this isn't a story um, or anything. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, my name's uh, Bobby Henry or Robert Henry Métis from Prince Albert, uh, University of Saskatchewan, can go on and on. Uh, I was one of the four uh, who was with, at the very beginning with Carrie Barassa uh, in the background, uh, because one, it wasn't safe for me. I was pre-tenured. Uh, so Caroline Tate took the brunt of that and went forward with that but I was one of the other four individuals behind that. So I saw everything that was done at the university, everything that was done from people in our community and ways in which elders' voices were actually used against us and damaging to us in order to protect somebody. So my question is, is what do we do when academics, those who are pretending to be indigenous, utilize and weaponize elders against ourselves, weaponize our culture against us, and we're the ones facing the backlash because we're not doing it kindly. We're the ones who aren't doing it respectfully. And where I come from and I was told is that when Indigenous law occurs, we pull people in the middle. We say, who are you? What are you doing? With my family, if you shit on us, we will put you in the middle and ask you what is going on. Tell us, who are you and what can we do? Because we need to know who these people are. Letters came to us that were signed by individuals across this country, weaponizing nine elders on there. Their names were on this letter to say, get rid of this claim about Carrie. So what from your point, as elders, as knowledge keepers, and others in here from the academic space, what do we do when those who we hold in high regard will not listen to us because they're also part of the issue, because they're also paid by the university to say certain things? So this becomes a really hard question. And I know you can't answer it, and I know I'm just bringing it up here, but this is a point of question that we need to ask ourselves. What do we do when our own culture is weaponized against us and we're told to leave, but those who are frauding are protected? So it's just a question that you need to start asking ourselves in here because over the last two days, I've been sitting here, I've been trying to bite my tongue and it's been very difficult. I've seen people in here over the past two years that I've had conversations with and I do have to go with Lynn, uh, Congratulations yesterday for being honest and open, the Valley, for saying, I'm sorry for not doing enough. I wish that more people were like that. I wish that more people stood up and said, I, was, I, I wish I did more to help and support you guys back in the day. Because we're benefiting from it now. We see people benefiting from these conversations today, from those who had to do the hard work and were pushed aside and are still not here to have those conversations. These are questions we need to ask ourselves. Do we want to be academics? Then ask those hard questions. If we want to be part of our community and support our community? Then we got to ask those hard questions from the community space. And I just, I, I just want to say I'm not seeing it here. And I know that's supposed to be a safe space. It's not safe for me here. It's not safe for people who had to do this early on. So no matter how much we want to praise ourselves, there's so much work to do. So I do want to recognize the elders because their stories 
there are knowledge pieces in those stories that we need to keep listening to and learning from today. And I just wanted to add that to that to contextualize this. We're still being pushed out. We're still, there's still things happening at CIHR where they're saying we got to do community this, community that, community that. And I'm like, you were taught by somebody who's non-Indigenous about what we are. You have to relearn this. But they're not relearning it. They're just saying, well, it's just community. But our community has weaponized against us. Mm -hmm. And we heard it the other day. Academics are not part of the community. It's bullshit. I am my community. My community is proud of me of where I am. They're proud to say, holy shit, Bob, you're a doctor. Be proud of it. So we've weaponized the academic against ourselves. We've weaponized ourselves against ourselves. We're weaponizing elders against ourselves. But again, follow the money. Who's getting rich off of it? Is that? And oh, and be kind. Yes, I, I apologize. I need to be kind all the time. That's not true. And if you, if you think that being kind all the time, come to my family and gatherings and see what that actually looks like. Because if being kind is yelling and screaming and everything else, no. And that's why there's laughing here, because we know what being kind is. Being kind is different. Being kind is being firm, being honest and everything else. That's being kind. Being kind isn't whitewashing, being soft. That's not being kind. That's setting people up for failure. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. I'm going to see if anybody wants to respond to that. Uh, I think um, some conversation I had with Cynthia and something that Lorna raised is this isn't a new issue. This has been going on since First Nations men were pulled aside and being told, you're the chief now, you can sign for treaty right now. And they weren't the headmen, they weren't the head chief, they weren't. This is a very old issue. And uh, and has deep, deep roots that we're seeing. But I want to ask Joseph or Lorna, Ripa, I can't see you, but oh, Joseph. Hello. Well, these are sometimes conversations uh, that I have with elders or my sister, you know, who is a lodge keeper. I was in that, I think uh, there was a letter I was involved in, you know, that was uh, implicated me. There was, uh, there was a document that came up, but it wasn't uh, complete. My name was just sort of slashed in uh, just my first name and then a little bit of my last name. But my immediate response was to uh, just reject it and you know, send it back and not include me, implicate me in that. It was very dangerous. And I was just starting to, I think, working at the College of Law. So, you know, that's, uh, I was thinking about that as well, you know, you don't want to get yourself into situations where you could, uh, I guess, compromise yourself, you're, you know, you're, I'm in a position there as a cultural advisor, thanks to Maria Campbell here, and it's, it's people like Maria that I defer to sometimes about issues like this, they're not easy, easy uh, things to, as they say, uh, I guess, to deal with, you know, and, and Nikia, Yes, and you know, just they could have pushed it back, you know, and not give it too much weight. And I, I recognize some of the names, or one of the names there, and I thought, Nick Scheme, wow, I know this person. Why is she doing that? You know, why is she putting herself in that situation? So, you know, Kasoemi, you know, to have to be, uh, I guess, uh, cautioned, you know, with these, uh, at that time it was. Barassa, you know, that we had to be cautious of that situation because it was just brand new and uh, leverage was she's trying to gain leverage in any way that she can because I guess she had something invested in that, you know, and when somebody has something invested, they'll they'll do whatever they can, you know, to to uh, try and avert any any opposition. So thank goodness it kind of took care of itself, you know, and then that's things kind of, but I just stay away from that kind of stuff. Anything, Laura? Yeah. Well, I think that it's, um, it's a, that's a, what you raise is a very good example of what happens to us. You know, that's, um, it has happened in many, many situations. 
I think when um, that when the issue of carry came up, there were very few people um, at universities who were taking and had active roles. Unfortunately, well, fortunately for us, people have been placed in universities who can give a lot more guidance. And, you know, and there's so much pressure and weight on the shoulders of those people who are now vice presidents and vice provosts, indigenous vice provosts. There were very few at that time. There are more now. And it's really important that we support those people as they do the complicated job of um, negotiating between two very different worlds, well, multiple worlds, but mainly two. And that's you know where we are now. And yes, there's a long, long way to go. And um, there's lots of anger, lots of resentment, lots of pain. And it's important that we don't only speak through the mouth of anger. Because we need to rebuild. We need to build institutions where our children and their children will thrive so that we can continue, our ways can continue and our relationship with this earth can continue. Thank you. Ripa, would you like to add anything to that about how we're treating each other and where the support comes from and elders being used against people who are trying to do the institutional heavy lifting? Um, is Ripa still online? Okay, I'm going. I can't, I don't hear you. I hope I'm not leaving you out. It's certainly, there she is. Yeah. As people were talking, few things came to my mind. Can you hear me now? Yes, we sure can. Okay. Um. It's a um, it's a hard topic, a tough uh, situation to be in. Uh, so one of the things I thought of is um, we gotta we gotta keep reminding ourselves who we are, mm -hmm. and we gotta keep moving forward because there's lots of people at stake. And um, and remember the teachings of our people, of our elders, to keep remembering them. My mother, um, maybe because of what or where we have come to as Inuit people, used to remind me sometimes not to go to bed angry. This was when I was much younger. Because if I keep building that up, I'm, I'm not going to be the person I was meant to be. I'm going to suffer. So these are very hard lessons and um, I just want to put that out. <clears throat> I've also lived through very difficult places personally because of how things happen sometimes and what people say. And so long time ago, I had to learn to 
really know me. People, people will say things about us that aren't true at all. How do I, how do I, you know, work through that when it's such a personal thing? So there was a point in my life where I said, I know me. I know who I am. And I know I have a creator who knows me more than anybody else. So it's it's very tough. I hear the person who has experienced what he shared, and I appreciate that. And it's something I struggle with, with even to this day of our own people really um, being negative about where who we are and what we've done and what we're trying to do because we didn't speak it right or we said the wrong pronunciation. So it's it's something that I kind of struggle with too personally, but I have to keep focusing on the next step because I have children, I have grandchildren like a lot of us do, and um, how we need to be role models to our precious ones and to our fellow people in our lives and in the lives of many. Um, I don't know if I even touch upon what what we're what we're talking about, but these are the things that came to my mind. That's and also to say how we how we need to keep work, working on ourselves because it's my responsibility to be the healthiest person I can be, uh, who can contribute, who can love and who can who can do beautiful things in this world because we're all in, in this together. We really are and we impact each other whether it's good or bad. So I want to choose to impact my children, grandchildren, other other people in a good way as much, much as I can, knowing that I also need to take care of myself, mm. knowing that I also need to have boundaries and, you know, um, so that I'm in a good headspace. Mm -hmm. Without doing that work within me, I can't, I can't do what I'm called to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I still have passion to help my people. When I was born, um, Inuit has a system, had a system where uh, a midwife would be called right from the camp, right from the camp. The lady that helped my mother uh, during her, uh, during my birth, um, predicted certain things about me as I was born, newborn. And she would repeat them to me as I was growing up. She was my Amnalia, who, who respected me and who helped me to be formed to who I am because of what she shared. Mm -hmm or visioned um, and I would I would be reminded of that and I didn't know I could do what she had said to me when I was born but I'm living the life that she had wanted me to be so words are powerful our words are powerful mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Thank you, Elder Evick. 
Uh, I've been told that I would like to give the last comments here to President Ottman, if that's okay, and maybe we can save some time if you'd like to come up and speak with the elders. Is that okay with you? There's a woman that's been sitting here waiting to speak. Does mic work? Okay, yeah. Okay, here we go. Um, I just really appreciate uh, this panel and and uh, the voices um, that we've heard over the last two years, and for for these for our elders to be um, sitting here and teaching us these really important lessons and. And that's what I've heard from my elders over the years too. It's, you know, they, they always loop back to, to the truth, the essence of, of who we are. But I'm also leaning into um, um, the lessons that, that I've currently been, that has, have been impressed upon me. And that's, that's the, the responsibility that's, you know the responsibility to to share, and um, and I acknowledge Robert Bobby, and and he's gone. No, he's here. Oh, is he's, he here? He's, he's here. here. Um, and the frustration and the pain, and and the anger, and um, you know I've had the. Um, I've worked in two of my alma maters, University of Calgary and University of Saskatchewan. That's where I gained my master's and PhD was the University of Saskatchewan. And I gained my MED, my B, sorry, my BED from University of Calgary. And now I'm here at First Nations University of Canada. I feel home. I, I don't have to expend energy on on advocating for space, but I understand that work, that work is important. And for each one of you as leaders um, to be in these positions is important. And for me, when I was at, because I was the inaugural Vice Provost Indigenous Engagement at University of Saskatchewan, and I stepped into that position at the age of 52, I didn't want to go into university leadership. That wasn't my aspiration. It was to impact Indigenous people in our communities. It still is. But in, the, in those positions, and I know people, when I was, um, you know, a university leader uh, within a mainstream university would say, would, would say, well, Jack, why isn't Jackie doing this? Why isn't Jackie doing that? Why didn't Jackie take care of the Kerry Barasa incident, right? And it's really tenuous space. And we try, like, that landed on my table two months before I was leaving. And then it's kind of like I'm already transitioning, right? And there were, of course, there were rumors. Um, but what, we, what do we do with that? Especially for many of us when this is the inaugural position, right? And, and so within these institutions, there is um, a divisiveness that happens that's created um, within these institutions, we are divided um, by policy. And, you know, we, we, um, we pit again, we, we pit ourselves against each other. And, and I think that's the, you know, the importance of a gathering like this is we start to identify um, what's important. And it is important for us to acknowledge the hurt and the pain that's happened to Indigenous peoples within these institutions. We couldn't even be in these institutions unless we enfra enfranchised from our communities. Now we're in them. And so I hope that what we will do 
is, um, you know, come up and provide a path forward. Um, so we can um, provide supportive spaces for, for our, our youth, those children not yet born. So it's an important time. It really, really is. And um, I just thank you again to the elders for reminding us the essence of who we are and the importance of not compromising who we are. And I think that's something for me is that I, I refused to compromise who I, who I was as an Indigenous person. That, that is unconditional for me. I would step away from a job rather than compromise that. Thank you. Mike, Mike, can I get you to take the microphone to this table over here? I made eye contact with a young woman here and told her she would have time to speak. And this isn't a space where we should start saying you're silenced. And so I hope that you can take a few minutes and allow this woman to have her voice heard. I want to say um, miigwech to our, our elders and um, for acknowledging my voice yesterday. I knew that um, coming here was going to be hard. Um, for those online um, that can't see me, um, my name is Kat Pasquatch. And um, I grew up, I grew up being told that I was something that I wasn't from my father. And so when you shared, you know, there's, we have families that also hid who they were. Mm -hmm. Like I knew that, but it didn't actually hit me until you framed it that way that I was a teenager when I found out that I, I'm not Portuguese. I'm not, um, I don't have ties to Brazil. My father told me that he's from El Salvador and he didn't, he had shame because it's a very poor country. And if you were from Brazil and Portuguese, you weren't poor. And at the time it, it really, I was, I was able to negotiate that in my mind because I, I was always stronger connected to my, my Cree family. Um, but what hit me is the voice that spoke earlier talking about not feeling safe. And I, I echo that sentiment here. Um, I work in student experience and I'm not an academic at the university. And so I, all the conversations that we've had have been centered around faculty. Faculty, mm -hmm. yes. And um, I haven't participated in the ceremonies, and I and I feel apprehension, and I and I'm realizing why. I realize that. Um, a lot of our academics here are angry. You spend so many years of your life in these violent institutions, earning those degrees. And then there's a, someone beside you pretending to be going through the same violent places and you're all hurting. 
And I haven't seen an opportunity for all of you to work through that. And I experience the, you know, things that in those institutions too, but it's not the same. And I'm like, no wonder why I feel so unsettled because I'm feeling everything else that you're experiencing. So I just needed to point that out that we have to find healing. You have to find healing amongst yourselves. And I'm just so lucky to be situated at the university where I'm not faculty and I don't have to go for tenure and I can piss everyone off there. <laughs> and I fight and I advocate for all of our new faculty and everyone there. And if they fire me, I didn't spend over 10 years of my life dedicated to a career. I, 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 I wear a much different hat and if they fire me, I'll come back in as a volunteer from the community. They're not gonna get rid of me so easily. But that's because that's my advantage of being in that space and using my voice. And I will fight for all of you, but I just want you all to take care of yourselves. Me which. Hi. Does anybody want to respond to this young woman, Lorna, Joe, Ripa? You want to say anything? Thank you very much for your sharing. It's, um, I think it's really important that our, our people are able to share their experiences and what and their feelings and and um, in this in these spaces and uh, and just to remind us of the complexity on one side of um, you know of um, what we need to do to rebuild ourselves and so thank you for your courage to sharing your story and. Um, and just keeping us aware. And that's um, always been an important part of young people in our communities, and having, making sure that, you know, that, um, that we're not blinded by all our years too. And so thank you. And, um, and it's important to know that, you know, that there are many people in this room who have the courage and the, and the, length in years to be able to do the work that we need to do and to in rebuilding our communities. Okay. So this morning I raised with two separate parties the fact that staff are not represented here and that I don't know how to create that space so that that voice gets to show up here and have voice here. I think there's a notion that we need to protect staff because they don't have tenure and they don't have things like that. And I also think it's really important to say they have something to teach us that's really profoundly important. And she called us out. She called us out and I will bow to that and say, you nailed it. And I want to say, Bobby Henry, Winona Wheeler, Carolyn Tate, Raven Sinclair, Janet Smiley. I want to put that in the room with us today and say they had Chelsea Gable. Chelsea Gable. They had no support systems. We were just getting our voices prepared to start talking in these spaces. And now we're coming together and we need to look after ourselves. All three elders told us all today, are you looking after yourself? Because you can't look after others if you're not looking after yourself. That our institutions need to support us and we need to figure out how to support, ask for that support and that we need to congregate to do that. I wanna give a last round of applause to our amazing teachers and before we go for lunch. A little levity.
We have new code shifting language that we can use with each other every time we find a Cherokee relative. We don't have to say anything except Mountain Dew from now on, just so you got that straight this morning. Uh, thank you, everybody. On behalf of uh, the News Select Committee, I'd like to honor all of these guests that are in person with the Indigenous box that we've been given to all of our in-person presenters as well, too. It's an awesome box. We can clap for this as well, too, please.